Hello, my soul-seeking friends. It's Shanna. Thank you so much for listening to Sense of Soul podcast. Enlightening conversations with like-minded souls from around the world, sharing their journey of finding their light within, turning pain into purpose, and awakening to their true sense of soul. If you like what you hear, show me some love and rate, like, and subscribe. And consider becoming a Sense of Soul Patreon member, where you will get ad-free episodes, monthly circles, and much more. Now go grab your coffee, open your mind, heart, and soul. It's time to awaken. Hey listeners, Merry Christmas. Today I have a gift for you, the lovely Diana Kelly. She has been receiving the initiations and empowerments of Sophia through the prism of Mother Mary and Anna, the grandma of Jesus, even before her own birth. These initiations have led Diana to becoming a voice for the Holy Sophia. She is a loving and conscious mystic and has been a spiritual healer for 30 years. I'm so excited to share with you today this beautiful episode. There's so much wisdom here. So please welcome Diana. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? You're going to love this. I went in with my mom and well, both of my daughters were supposed to go, but one was sick. But we went to see Annie. Oh, nice. The play. Yes. Wow. It was. Wow. Yeah. I really connected with my childhood. <laughs> oh, very cool. You know, I lived in New York for a while, so I did a lot of those things there. I tended to do them more. Yeah, it was really good. It's so amazing because, I mean, these children can just sing so good. They're so talented. It's so amazing. Talented. I know even, even on a, like a local level, my, my uh, youngest son went to a high school that was art. You know, you had a test to get in any artistic endeavor, like his was more graphic art, but, and I used to go to all the, the events and stuff and they were so talented. The, the kids that actually did performance and, you know, yeah. dance and, oh my gosh. I know yeah. it's incredible. I love to go to the local high schools too. Yeah. And, and do that. I enjoy it so much. But yeah, it was really fun. My mom is hilarious. She <laughs> went and got the CD. So when mm-hmm. I get in the car, because I she always wants me to drive her car. So we get in the, her car and she pops it in and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> We're really getting in the mood. <laughs> so funny. But I remember going to see that movie. It's the first movie I ever remember seeing in oh. the movie theater. And I was living in New Orleans at the time. So it was a really early memory of mine. Wow. I think my first one, I mean, I'm older than you, but my first one was uh, Mary Poppins. But I think it had been around for a while. But I went with like two great aunts. I I grew up in Philly. Okay. And I grew up in a real kind of neighborhood that I don't find maybe in New York, but not really out Westmore where it's like, generations like came over from wherever and stayed yes right like for you know many I I think I was like the first one that moved really you know far away other than like across the bridge to New Jersey or whatever like 20 minutes away I could walk to both all four grandparents great two great grand sets of great grandparents um great aunt their brothers and sisters so great aunt so I had all of that influence in fact and you know this is kind of a lead in that I didn't expect but that's really where my real spirituality came from is those older like grandparents and great aunts and uncles um yeah more than my parents wow I you know very similar like I I think that New Orleans maybe these older cities yes yeah it was at six years old, literally walking from my mm-hmm. aunt's to my mama's house. And we, mm-hmm. yeah, all, and we were the first family that actually moved out of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah same. And I, I laugh because I'm like, <clears throat> dude, I was not supposed to be walking around the streets that young, going across <laughs> like big streets. I oh know. My I know when I think about it, I was like, I had just freedom, you know? Sure. And I would walk in in Philly. I don't know if it's the same in New Orleans, but they have like alleyways between the houses because it's all these. Yes. 
And I would walk in the alleyways and like nothing, you know, like it was oh my just gosh. Yes. My... In fact, I talk about that alley all the time because there was a Doberman pincher oh. that would, you know, bark at you and jump really high. And it, there was all this fear. So we would run as fast as we could, but that was like an obstacle and a challenge that yes. we had to go through daily. <laughs> Totally. And, um, or, you know, and some alleys were worse than others and you did want to run through. And I can remember my mother leaving my younger, cause I'm the oldest of four. I can remember leaving the babies, the infants outside yeah. in their, in their baby, ca- like the pram, you know, like parked outside for hours. Cause they wanted them to sleep in fresh air and like, that was okay. That the worst. Yeah. Sometimes they would put net over it because they were worried about flies. But that yes. Was- <laughs> oh my <laughs> goodness. Well, and Diana, you know what else? I could hear from my mama's house. I remember, you know, the steamboats. You could hear them right there because we we're real close to the levee to the Mississippi, and then you could hear the church bells like mm-hmm. on the hour mm-hmm. from right, the Catholic right. church that I'd walk to. Yes, I think New Orleans has parishes too. Yeah. Like. In Philly, we, like you would identify yourself, your neighborhood by your parish. Oh, wow. They have parishes too? Yeah. Oh, wow. And so, and so I grew up in Our Lady of Mount Carmel, yeah, generations, but had gotten married there. And so I, you know, I went to 12 years of Catholic school. Uh, last four were in all girls Catholic school. They were, it was probably between 2,000 and 2,500 girls in, in the school. And, and it sounds like maybe a horror, you know, for most, I loved it. It was yeah. like, I just kind of, I, I really thrived in your in, sisterhood. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, a very, like, I guess somewhat unusual. I'm not in my, I'm the first person to go to a public school on both sides of my family ever. Oh, oh wow. Wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So in Philly, honestly, it wasn't an option because the public schools were so challenging that you. Yeah. Like, Same in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, at least my parents felt that you did, but um yeah. But of course, tuition at the time was like, I think five, for high school, $500 a year. And that oh, wow. and if you had more than one child, they, it was all covered, you know, so it exactly everybody. <laughs> so Well, I'm curious to know, like I know in Louisiana and I've talked to other people who have validated this, but, you know, if you had a big family, which they did mm-hmm. usually, mm-hmm. you know, it was a very mm-hmm. big family, you know, it would be that maybe one or two would become a nun or a priest. Interesting. My senior year nun uh, who taught creative writing actually called my mother at one point and was trying to persuade my mother. You're getting recruited. I was being recruited. And I was so, I was kind of a little insulted because I was like, why am I, am I not, you know, cool enough? Like, what is it about me? You know, but mm. I think that they saw something that they, they didn't know what, how to categorize it. You know, nuns picked up on it right away. Like I would be asked at six, first grade to lead, you know, 200 second graders in the communion around the church because they knew I wouldn't be all over the place and they could count on me. I would have to wear, you know, the little white communion dress, but a year ahead of time and lead the second graders and, and then also do the May procession. And we would circumambulate the church. And I was, you know, part of the crowning of the blessed mother uh, for, you know, the May processions and things. So, you know, fortunately, actually, I, I had at least mother Mary as a, a figure holding the divine feminine. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. So. My mama, she, you know, she taught me how to do the rosary and I have very early memories of that. And I mean, boy, we would pray, you know, and ask for forgiveness and ask for protection and ask for this and ask yes. for that yes. <laughs> my whole <Yes>. life. <laughs> you know, at one point, when we moved to Colorado, which is completely opposite. Opposite, right, right. And I really, really looked up to my mama. She was so selfless. I mean, so selfless. And people say all the time that I remind them of her. And, Uh you know, that used to be such a compliment. But then I'm like, no, but, you know, I've broken that. And my daughters have broken that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is okay to love yourself. It doesn't mean that you are selfish. Right. You know, right. Yeah. Right. True. True. And and that's a hard one. You know, that we're setting boundaries and thinking that that's not uh, loving, 
or not compassionate or empathetic. You know, there's, there's all that. And that this is just generational. It is. And what about in your family? I don't know, but in mine, the men were like messiahs. (laughs) All the boys in the family. (laughs) And it was almost like, even if you had, you know, with like your brother, take care of your brother. right? Right. And even when I had my first son, it was like that. Wow. You know, for wow. a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think there definitely were tones of that more in my grandparents than I think my mother was trying to. So she had three girls and one boy and, and okay. he definitely was treated differently, but not as not so extreme, you know, and mm-hmm. um, and I probably I mean, my daughter lets me know that I continued that a bit. I do. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> But I think it, it takes time sometimes for things to work out. You know, I always wonder sometimes when we look back or people, let's say a hundred years from now, look back and my generation I'll speak of. So I was born in the early sixties. So I'm, I'm 60. We got a little bit lost in between like the old world and the new world. You know, it's kind of like negotiating that. And I've done a lot of work and a lot better job as I've gotten older on that, and certainly living out in California has definitely, I don't even know if it would have been possible, not 30 years ago. I think it required me to move and yeah. be a whole different environment and thinking and stuff like that. Yeah. And you know, there's this holding on to the roots and the traditions, I think, yes. in the older yes. world. Yeah. And, and, and I totally value that. I value now in a whole new way saying the rosary, for example, you know, and I don't look at it as this chore and I look at it as this amazing mantra and almost like, like the Hail Mary is kind of like a spell that we would say. And I really do get, Mm -hmm. you know, that I certainly, and I'm sure you and many other women these days would have been considered witches back. I know. (laughs) Yes, for sure. (laughs) You know, yeah, Yeah. that's why one of the books I love from years ago is The Red Tent, because it was like told from a woman's perspective. I think history told from a woman's perspective, which we don't really almost never hear, right? Because Mm -hmm. we're not a prominent voice, is really a whole other thing, a whole other take. Yeah, I mean, I think about that with the Bible. I'm like, it was not written for women. It was written by men for men. Right. You know, it's kind of interesting. One of my real big openings that happened at my Saturn return, you know, I was living in Brooklyn and had started having a lot of spiritual experiences. That's really when I began my relationship with Mother Mary, but it was born out of not being able to feel like I could go to God Mm. for anything. It was too intimidating for me. So I figured, you know, she was like an intermediary, which is really how she was portrayed in the Catholic church, right? As the intermediary, but she was accessible. She was a mother. She was accessible. She was compassionate. And and she was my, my entry into the whole world of the divine feminine. But, you know, I started my automatic writing back then in the early nineties, getting messages from her. You know, my path has taken many turns since then, but, but that was my, my initial. That's so interesting. You know, I don't think I've ever thought about that until right now when you're saying that, like, where was my entry? But, you know, I think mine was with Mother Cabrini. Mm. I have a very, very strong connection to Mother Cabrini because of New Orleans, but also because of here in Colorado, we have a huge statue of her in the mountains. It's beautiful, but I felt like she was like the little woman that could (laughs) kind of like the little engine that could, but, and I just thought that, oh my God, like this woman back then who wasn't even in the best health got from one side of the country to the other and back and helped so many children. I went to that statue there. In I we have, in it's Colorado. powerful. Yes. yes. It's not yes. such a powerful spiritual presence. Like even if you're not spiritual and you go there, it's so powerful. So I think that that's actually my entry. Thank you for helping mm-hmm. me connect yeah. with that because no one ever told me that there was any kind of divinity in being a woman. I mean, other than having a child and being a wife and and serving. Yes. Right. And I have such a different perspective now. <laughs> right. Amazing. And I see when I bring this idea to, like, I work in a recovery center 
offering Reiki and, you know, I, I kind of put Reiki as the overall umbrella, but it's spiritual mentoring and cumulative of all the things that I've done for 30 Mm -hmm. years. But women will say to me, I cannot connect with my higher power, like AA really strongly, obviously Mm. emphasis on that. And I've been asking for 20 years, I can't do it. These are people that are like sitting very resistant, not necessarily spiritual, her arms crossed, like, what is this, you know, and I start talking about the divine feminine or the, the idea that there's a feminine aspect to the divine mm-hmm. and, and to God. And literally, like I've had people start crying and saying, yeah, oh, this is what I've been looking for. for like I feel like that happened to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. And, and I've had other, you know, people that have had that happen. They're like, I never thought of it. Like it just never entered my mind. Never. Never, ever entered my mind. Yeah. Yeah. It was a really shock. I think that we, like, there's so many things like that, like in life that, um, and I know that there's another woman I'm taking this line from, but these are the waters that we swim in because we're so used to this, that's just being what is that we don't take time to look at. Well, what about this? Like I was a trained massage therapist. Like the first time I saw, like maybe 10 years later, a picture of the female body muscle structure, I was like, oh my God. Like I never, you know, I only, I only, you only see a male right. body. And you know, well, I'm a massage therapist too. I'm finding this to be disturbing right now. <laughs> <laughs> Even like the breast tissue and all these like m- muscles and things that almost looks like flowers. And it was disturbing to me that I had never seen a picture of the female right. muscular structure, the anatomy, and bringing back that like in so many levels. So for me, it's like the rise of the divine feminine is all of it. It's like bringing the attention totally like it's this area that we haven't seen in this area and this area and this area, you know, um, even let's say ultrasounds, ultrasounds were only became a thing because it was developed for the astronauts originally NASA developed for the astronauts. And that's the only reason why we really have ultrasounds. So there's just so many things. I'm also a doula. So I, I okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been led to so many beautiful journeys. I I have, I mean, you know, you certainly can see the hand of the divine and think of myself as pretty much come full circle from my own birth because so my mother lost a baby before me she went into labor at seven months and lost the baby so her and my both grandmothers and their sisters all started praying uh, the rosary and a novena to Anna or Saint Anne right for my conception and then my mother made a, you know, a prayer saying if I, she felt like she was having a girl the first baby was a boy that if I was okay that she would put the name Anne or Anna in my name. And while she was laboring with me in the Catholic hospital and the nuns were rubbing relics of Anna on my my mother's stomach. So, you know, then I'm oh bringing this, you know, the holy womb chakra teachings and the doula work and everything and that consciousness back. It's like full circle, not full circle. Oh my God. I love that so much. I, you know, I love that so much. God, I feel so connected to you. Oh, thank oh yeah. You. I have, and I have goosebumps all over. You know, I, I think that there's another space where I was able to connect, but I, I didn't at the time know what's happening, but, you know, being from New Orleans, I'm also French Creole. So, and I discovered all this during a very long like almost six year journey through my ancestry, wow. but you know, the French Creole women, well, they really truly were the first single mothers here in America because you were not allowed to marry outside of your race. Oh. So if you had a white father, his goal was to whitewash. So it was illegal. So you could have children with him and he would provide a house for you money, maybe, but he was also free to marry you know, someone else was white. These French Creole women, I just felt so much sadness for and had this very clear vision of one of them on their knees, just praying for the women in the future, for their granddaughters and their granddaughters that one day 
you know, wouldn't be like that. And also I have Marie Laveau in my tree too, who was also to me in doing a lot of research on her. I mean, what a powerful woman for her Mm -hmm. time who was of color as well. She was also French Creole, but she did have a white father. So she was in the same boat. I just looked at that and it gave me this fire inside to really want to see the, the stories be told and also to to stop that within this lineage. Absolutely. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's powerful. Yeah. It was. And that I think that was a huge part of my journey in mm. discovering that the divine feminine as well. Mm. So, and also to stop that within this lineage. Absolutely. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's powerful. Yeah. It was. And that I think that was a huge part of my journey in mm-hmm. discovering the divine feminine as well. Mm-hmm. So, but I wanted to ask, you know, not many people ever talk about, you know, grandma Anna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the Catholics, at least in Philadelphia, and I think other places call her Anne, St. Anne. Yeah, Saint Anne, St. Anne. You know, I, I kind of think of it's Anne is more like the French and Anna would be more like the Italian version, you know, type of thing. Yeah. Um, and I think we get different things from different people refer to her differently, but I, I have always had a strong resonance with her. I can't really explain it except to say that I think it was there. I feel that she oversaw my incarnation. Yeah. Now, so now people might interpret that different ways. You know, you were part of her, her soul group or whatever. I don't know, but I know that Somehow she has overseen my incarnation. I mean, literally, like my female relatives praying novenas to her Mm -hmm. and the nuns doing the relics, rubbing the relics. Yeah. You know, and I like, I really had a dedication to Mary since I was, that I can remember from about three years old. So when I talk about my entry into this, it's kind of like, maybe that was my second entry. So I, I was kind of born into it. Right. And then. I shut down consciously when I was about nine or 10, I started having the experiences of leaving my body and helping like the older relatives pass over. I had nobody to really go to, to kind of explain what was happening. And I started, it started to kind of scare me because I would know like if somebody was going to die in their sleep, I would, I would see myself leave my room and go to their house and be at the foot of their bed and helping them pass over and then didn't know the next morning I would find out that like, oh, Uncle George died, but I already knew and I was happy for him, right? In that way. And I couldn't reconcile how sad everybody else was with that. And it was creating, you know, so I basically I can remember sitting up in my bed as like I just want to be normal, whatever normal is. But when I did that, I feel like I I um you know how that is, you can't cut off part of yourself. Mm-hmm. So when I did that, I was cutting part of myself off. And then I kind of lost my bearings in the world a little bit. Like I didn't know what I really liked anymore. When I look back on it now, I'm like, wow, like that was a big choice. And then I opened up again, like that was when I'm on my conscious getting on a path. I was about 28. You know, interestingly enough, um, I started to really question you know, the whole existence of God at them at that time. And I had some experiences that were disturbing around that and scary, Mm -hmm. actually. So I started calling on Mother Mary and I actually felt some beings like I felt her presence in my apartment with like three other beings that felt male to me. And they were like monitoring me. I felt like they were monitoring my process. I almost felt like a little child. You know, you see little kids on preschool holding onto a rope and, you know, they're being pulled yeah. along to wherever. That's what it felt like to me. Like I was being like pulled along. Like they were like making sure that I was somehow still on my path, even though I was doing my own thing. I know Much what you're talking about. I yes. felt that. Yes. 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 So this is pre, you know, being able to order anything off of Amazon, but I would, <laughs> order, I would order books from the Edgar Casey Foundation down in Virginia Beach and like have them delivered and like read them and be all, you know, get all interested. That was all in New York. And then I was guided to move to California from New York. That was definitely like, I'm going to say a huge initiation because mm-hmm. I, it required an enormous amount of faith to make that move. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was a big move. 
And I did it with three kids and two stepchildren in tow, ages one and a half to 16. And it was, it was intense. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. 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 Yeah, That's amazing. But I know exactly what you're talking about. I remember there were times in my life that I definitely was doing some stuff I wasn't supposed to be doing. And I was, you know, and, but yet I knew that I had such a strong protection, like spiritually. Yes. And when I look back, I, I've always referenced that I had powerful prayers for me from my aunts mm-hmm. and from my mom and my momo, who almost I felt held that space for me. Yes. And still loved me through it. And, and you know, I totally got through it. Well, one, because I became a young mother in my 20s. So, you right. know, but it was around 30 as well. I I think that is so divine. I mean, call it whatever you want. There is that, yeah. you know, connection to, you know, the Saturn return that, I mean, all of a sudden I just was like, who am I? What am I doing? And I started questioning everything. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I and I do think that like, you know, at the time I can remember sitting with my father's mother a lot and she would be praying the rosary and I would be just, you know, kind of like, oh, you know, this is just her praying for why and she would say, I pray for you. And I was like, oh, that, you know, that's nice. But it wasn't, I think now I'm like, wow, like my path has been challenging. And what would it have been if I didn't have all that grace and those prayers and and things like that that I really value so much now? Like me wow. too. Like that was that was really big. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like my mama had like a direct line straight to whoever was, <laughs> was you know all powerful. That was yeah. That she would send her prayers to. But yeah. you know you also create such a beautiful space. I've been in your circles with Dan Morris, who yes. I've had on before. And I just very rarely have I found myself so relaxed in a space. Your voice too would absolutely captivate my soul, not my mind. My mind would completely shut off, but I felt very, all I can describe is like captivated in your words and in the space that you hold. Mm -hmm. And both times that I've been in that space with you, I have felt so much of the divine feminine come forth and have not chose to put out thoughts to her or prayers and Mm -hmm. have only been opened almost like a flower opening Mm -hmm. just to truly receive and I have, and it's been always very divine. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much. I, it's it's nice to get validation and, and perspective on how people are experiencing that energy. And I know that I have levels, like, like when I'm doing an invocation or calling in a space, it's like one thing. And when I'm at work and I'm, I'm bringing that through, it's another and different yeah. languaging, speaking to different people. But I think in general, there's an energetic, as we all know, on the spiritual path right now, especially, there's a lot of talk about ascension. But I think we're also each having the experience of the descension, right? The descension mm-hmm. and becoming embodiments ourselves of the divine feminine or Sophia energy. And I do look at Mother Mary and Mary Magdalene and Kuan Yin as high expressions of that embodiment. Yes. And, but I do think that it's available to us now. Mm -hmm. It's time to bring that in. And I have had, you know, many experiences. Some of my most recent um, powerful experience was in France. Dan and I, we did a trip we went around to all the cathedrals and or, or not all you're so fear yes. 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 <laughs> I so love it. Tour. Yeah. And sitting in Rhymes Cathedral, which is the cathedral where almost all the kings of France were coronated and some of the queens. Wow. And I was sitting in a pew. I have this certain pew at, at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. Sophia had asked me to, to go there 
back in 2014, at least once or twice a week and walk the labyrinth. And then I developed this kind of relationship with a pew placement in the, on the, ch in the church um, and the cathedral that really was like a portal for me. So at Dan's suggestion in rhymes, he said, why don't you go sit in the same pew, count back your pews and find your spot. And so I did. And sure enough, there was a huge portal. And I really, I almost felt like Sarah was, was coming in like being come down my through my crown and down my body to really um and it came initially it came to about like my maybe my heart chakra and then the next day it went down further and then finally at Avebury which is the kind of the sister of Stonehenge in England we because we wound up going to England too oh, um, wow. and I felt like it really grounded into the ground there um but I it was a real physical sensation and and again at rhyme so i'm sitting there right and and my head starts like the around the top of my head where you imagine a crown would be starts getting tight like as if i have a wreath on and then the inside here was started burning like i was being like i was getting a sunburn and it went on like you know it wasn't like painful painful but it was like oh my head's like hot like i would normally do something about this and so I felt like it was kind of like an etheric level of a coronation and I had been given a coronation ritual I, I was asked to do a bridal chamber event here in San Francisco Bay Area Marin County uh, years back I think it was 2016-17 and uh, for the bridal chamber ritual I wound up uh, receiving this coronation ritual from Sophia, where I felt like a dove put a substance in my left hand. And then I was given these certain positions. So I worked, I did the ritual and I think I must've worked on at least a hundred, maybe a hundred and somewhere between a hundred and hundred and maybe 20 people that day doing this, um, what I call the holy ampulla of Sophia. Oh. And so I didn't even know what an ampulla was apparently. So at Rhymes, they do have the oil that they used to use for all these carnations from like 300 AD all the way up until the end of the French monarchy and all the, the all, all the kings and everything. Then they use this oil and um, it's called, they call it ampoule. I guess it's a French word. And so they spell it differently than we do, but it, it translated to ampoule in English and so that's the the ritual I do for helping us to put our crowns back on that we were always meant to have. I feel like it was, I was given it a little bit maybe before it's time. I mean, I worked on, but now it's kind of, yeah. 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 So it was kind of uh, like really one of those shocking, shockingly uh, believing, you know, when the, when the veils open and you have full on experiences of another. Yeah. I am forever grateful that I feel like in that sense, like you were saying about, about your grandmother, that I, like the foundation was laid, like the yeah. foundation was there. Mm, you are making my heart just less angry. <laughs> oh. Oh. I don't know if Dan shared with you, because for sure, when I had him on, I was still going through, I almost felt like I had religious trauma syndrome. Oh. Like, you know, it was just was so angry that the divine feminine had been kept in the dark for generations. And the more I read the Gnostic Gospels, the more I got angry in some way oh. that it was kept from us. And I just wanted everyone to know. <laughs> like, like that's a healthy anger, you know? I, I had a similar experience. So the holy womb teachings were on palm, kept on palm leaves and only kind of shared with the saints and sages of India for like literally at, le at least 7,000 years, somewhere between seven and 10,000 years. So they were originally given, the teachings were originally given to the Septarishis, which was seven great sages of India, and then only passed down to either saints or sages in India until about, I'm going to say 20, maybe 10, something like that. And they were a young male Indian guru came, Sri Kaleshwar, came uh, to California and opened an ashram originally down in Santa Cruz and, and then kind of set up different ones. And I went to these teachings. They, he taught the teachings to his close followers. 
but this was the first time they're going to offer a class and then have us have the ability to be teachers of it. So I went to that training in Mendocino and out here, but the same reaction was kind of like, these were kept from us for like, you know, who ever even heard of a womb chakra? Like, what is that even? It is a different chakra, but you don't hear about it in the seven main chakras because I believe because of its power. So what struck me, what why I was even open to these this teaching and going there for this training was because I'm I'm like, so if this young male Indian guru is coming here and saying that he said Mother Mary was the most powerful master that ever lived. And I was like, what? Yeah, what? What? <laughs> and what the reason he said is because she knew these teachings, she had access to them. And that's how she was able to bring in an avatar like Jesus. There's practices, there's mantras. Well, and not just her, you know, like I'm sure Mother Anna knew it. Women in that orbit, you know, knew these Well, things. you know, I think John, John, I had on John Van Aken of the Edgar Casey Foundation. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, you know, and he even knew Edgar Casey's uh, secretary who did all the writing. And, oh, wow. And he has wrote many books, but one of them, he wrote about the a scene. And he, I believe, really believed that Mary and her mother and all of them were part of the Essene. Yeah. Yeah. And they definitely had higher teachings. Of, See, but that's it. There's all this secret societies that knew this yes. information yes. because yes. they had to keep. And so that's kind of what I, I had to go through it. I grow through it just like I did with my ancestry. It was foreign to me. And what I find is so remarkable is that, and I know it's happened to more than you and I, is that we're receiving these things in different ways. However, we are receiving very similar things. Yes. You know, and and they're not from books. They're not from, you know, a lot of it is experience or that we are divinely led like you were to find Mm -hmm. this womb healing. Like it was there you know, right, for you, right. you know, to make that move to move on to the next stage that you were ready for. For years, I had uh, been part of other Indian guru groups and which were, which were wonderful. And they definitely helped me on my path and all due respect, right. I was kind of ready to move on from that. Mm-hmm. And I was a little bit concerned when I was there that I was, oh, am I kind of getting caught in this, you know, again, right, my, I, yeah. not my thing right now. And, and Sophia came in and she said, these are my teachings. My goodness. And then I could relax and I could really like, okay, I can get with that program. I'm good. I don't have to worry that I'm going into what I kind of look as an old paradigm, right? Where the male guru type of thing. Exactly. Just relax and say, oh yeah, right. Out of here, when's the first time that you even heard of the name Sophia? Because there are Saint Sophias, you know. Yes. I, and I've done yes. research on that. None that any Catholic I know have ever been able to explain to me who she is. <laughs> no, I never, as growing up Catholic, I, I yeah, never, I didn't either. But I know that there is just because yeah, I've done research I, I have on heard her. other people that were raised Catholic that say that they had some exposure. To, I, I didn't. No. So um, my first experience was in, uh, I was living in Mount Shasta in 2007. Wow. <laughs> and I, she came in and um, she had a green dress on and she had a mala like this, which is a really long lotus seed mala, right? These are lotus seeds. So it makes then they're long beads. So it makes the mala really long. And she had it at her, like hanging, like the nuns used to, they used to like hang rosaries or something. So she had it kind of hanging that way and she was just flicking it. And she said, I am going to bring you to all of my highest teachings and um, I will give you my keys. And, and then that was it. And then I didn't really have any real experience. I thought about the experience from time to time, but I didn't really feel like I was receiving any keys years past. 
And um, fast forward to I'm living in San Francisco and she comes in again. And I'm thinking like, who is this? Is this the Black Madonna? Like, what is this energy? And then she was more specific. And she said, I'm going to bring you to my highest teachings and I'm going to ask that you resist none. And I am preparing you to be a voice for Sophia in the world, voice for me, basically, voice for me in the world, Sophia. And um, what is she else is saying? Base, oh yeah, um, people are going to need the mother in ways that we you cannot understand now. So this, you know, look where we are now. I mean, it was yeah. bad then, but, and it was a very clear, although she didn't spell this out, it, it felt very clear that it had some relevance to the three major religions in the world, you know, which we're dealing with right now, right? The Christianity uh, or one of the three major. Like um, the Abrahamic religions or. Right. Um, and, and there was something with that. And at that point, I hadn't realized how powerful, for example, Mary was in the or how honored she was in Islam. Then I heard this statement. She appears in the Quran more times than she does. I heard that. Yes. yes. And then I happened to go to an art museum in San Francisco, the Asian Art Museum, and there and I wound up kind of tagging along its tour. And it was about oil, the Silk Road, and how they would, you know, mm -hmm. oils and transfer these, do the trade. And the uh, guide was telling a story how when they came in and took over some of the churches, they did not defame uh, the statues of mary they they would destroy everything else but they would not they would leave her intact like they wouldn't chop her head off or the statue or anything and i was very impressed by that i was like wow there's something here so i felt like there was something about the divine feminine or the mother like i guess this was showing me that there's real substance to my message i guess at that time i'm still thinking it was going to be coming through the prism of mother mary mm -hmm. but and then, you know, I got a little, you know, a little bit more of a perspective on that. So that's when she asked me to walk the Labyrinth at Greece Cathedral, okay. once or maybe twice, which I did. And the first time I got into the center of the labyrinth, she said, welcome back. And she handed me a yellow rose, which mm -hmm. I didn't realize at the time the color yellow, but a yellow rose is symbolic of a friendship, some kind of camaraderie type of thing. And oh whereas like red would be romantic love and, you know, that kind of thing. And, I, and then I started to, you know, get more messages. I would sit in that particular pew. It would become a portal. I would receive guidance. And I was taken to many different teachings. And, you know, some of them were a little bit triggering. And I'd say the highest one probably was the womb chakra teachings. Yeah. So like you were saying earlier, I still had some of that wounding. So I would get triggered by the... You know, mm -hmm. this is coming through a mail or this is whatever's being said or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I really just, you know, that's probably why she kind of gave me a heads up. And I would keep reminding that, <laughs> reminding myself that she had asked that of me, don't, don't resist them, you know. So, so that's how develop began developing a relationship with her. And, be, and I received like initiations from uh, many different goddesses, like through, I'll say through the prism of different goddesses, okay. like different things. And I don't know if you read the Sophia Code, but she talks about the different goddesses. And I had some of the same goddesses as that she had. Wow. Are you serious? She does. Yes. You know, I've stayed away from a lot of books like that. Right. I've only read ancient texts and, and and I read Dan's book. And if, But I wanted to stay away from what other people were receiving. But I kept finding that other people were receiving the same as me. Yeah. So I, and I think that there's, I, it, it's interesting you say that because I've done the same thing by and large, like, even though I did have that book and I scanned it, I didn't really read it cover to cover, no dishonor. It's just that I right. didn't want my experience to be colored. That's how I felt. That's yeah. how I felt as well. I but I'm freaking out because, you know, mine was all got, I mean, I had several, just like you said, goddesses come through and my first one was in a green dress. Wow. And yeah. It's in the, yeah, it's the first chapter of my book. It's in the first episode, you know, of my Sophia series, but and it was through my youngest first. She oh. had told me that she had a dream that she had a new angel and she was in a green dress with burgundy trim and she had long red hair. Wow. And then suddenly like the most crazy synchronicity 
I mean, just, yeah, just ridiculous, just okay. ridiculous. And wow. it ended with Bridget Fling Claire, who was a Bridget, who told me in her episode about her book that she was also leading groups. One was the Keys of Enoch and the other one, and she had a very, she has a beautiful accent from England. And the other one was Pissa Sophia. Wow. And I was, when I went back to, cause I, I was really interested in the keys of Enoch because I was studying the book of Enoch and all of that stuff at the time. So I said, well, I'll order the keys of Enoch, but I want to get that other book she was talking about too. So I was looking for priestess of fear. (laughs) I'm like, I can't find this damn book. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. And that is how, and when I went to order the keys of Enoch, which I did underneath it, there was another beautiful full white book with gold letters on the front that said Epista Sophia. And wow. I said, oh my gosh, that's the priestess of fear. Wow. Um, and so I ordered it just blindly and both books led me to where I am today. And with so much synchronicity, I also received around that time, this dream, my dreams are very amazing, but um, what looks like a labyrinth. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so- wow. Um, and then the dove has been a very significant part of my journey, which also has had a dark turn. I don't know if Dan shared with you about that. I but, think, uh, yes, I do remember. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm not, I don't, I'm pretty, I, I the just, yeah, uh, it, there's no doubt that the divine feminine is rising and connecting with those who I think had the foundation to be open to receive this if they followed, you know, their call. Yeah. which I see is really happening in a lot of people. I have goosebumps all over my face right now and everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I felt very alone in this for a while. I think I even shared that with Dan because I was so happy to speak with someone who knew the divinity of Sophia and a scholar when it comes to Sophia. He was validating so many things for me. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the things that uh, where I really appreciate the fact that in a way that I haven't been exposed, you know, over the years to all these things real intensely because yeah. since we've been together and we, and we were friends for probably maybe seven years before getting into a relationship within the same community in terms of spiritual community. And, and we had done talks together on Sophia and things, but I, I was always coming from personal experience, but I would, I, I didn't know like, so I would be able to share with him experiences. And he would say, oh, like yeah. that's in thunder, perfect mind, or that's in, and, and I, just, it was great because in a sense, I didn't have that like preconceived yeah. idea because yeah. I actually did have a, uh, a thunder experience. Wow. I, I was staying at an ashram, at Sri Aurobindo and the mother have I had this, you know, kind of real private ashram that I would go to and, and stay for a few days in exchange for, you know, work a few hours a day or something. And one night in bed and I hear this like loudest thunder that you'd ever imagine to hear. And I hear she is here and so intense. And I don't like, there wasn't much after that, just that the power, the power is just like the sound of her and the power and her being introduced. And later when I was sharing this experience, he's like, you had a thunder experience? Well, that is definitely Sophia. Like that is a whole thing, you know? And it was funny in the ashram the next day, I was like, oh my God, but but that storm was crazy. And, and Nobody's like, what storm? <laughs> you know, I wow, thought, okay. Yeah yeah. 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 So it was kind of uh, a, like really one of those shocking believing, you know, when the veils open and you have full on experiences. Yeah. Yes. It's yeah. amazing. And I also love that your purpose is, you know, to really raise the consciousness of yes. humanity to receive this. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Because you really do have to. There's no way I could have reasoned. If you would have told me this 10 years ago, right. I would have been like praying for you at church. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, I hear you. My goal with people is to never make any, push anybody further away. I'm not too heavy handed on that for people that are not used to this. Because I, you know, talking about God as feminine for a lot of people is super triggering. I mean, it most is. people 
people still. I mean, it's very triggering. And so, you, you know, it's a, it's a very gentle, you know, introduction and, but the people that are like ready for it and can hear it, it just like something mo- moves, you know? Yeah. yeah. You know that, I mean, I don't know about with your family, but you know, my mom, she knows all about Sophia because, you know, she's, she'll be here in and out of and over all the time. And, and I'll tell her, you know, this and that. I mean, she fully believes in Sophia. I mean, she's still Catholic. She still goes to church, mm-hmm. but in the way that I, it's almost like she's had like the drip of Sophia, not like a teaching of it right? and not, you know, she's seen me evolve through it. So I know what I had to go through to be able to accept that. And so, you know, to see my mom, you know, kind of, you know, want to hear about her, want to hear the stories um, in the Gnostic, want to hear the stories of Mary Magdalene about how she was such a big part of, she was a disciple, his greatest disciple. And, and she wanted to learn. She was hungry. Like I am, I feel that. Yes. Yes. I think that they still can connect to it because it is a Christian teaching. (laughs) Right, Just one right. that you know they haven't heard. Yes, yes. So I again, I think there's degrees of that, and people can receive what they're ready to receive. And yeah. I can remember, you know, when you asked me my my first introduction, but years ago, I was on a call with um, quite a few Waldorf teachers, and that was the first time I used to hear them talking about Sophia. But I didn't quite get who she was at the time. Right. But I was very fascinated and very drawn to it. But I, I kept saying I must not be understanding, and I guess they just assumed everybody on the call understood, and so there wasn't a real explanation. Um, but I think she was working in my consciousness for years before I was ready. And certainly through Mother Mary. So if somebody asked you, who is Sophia? Mm-hmm. Which is a very complex question. It is a very complex That's question. like asking who is, you know, God or who is Jesus, you know, yeah. really. Yeah. So I think of Sophia as she's like the feminine aspect of God. And she is equal and she is different. I believe all souls come from her womb. I believe that she is the divine feminine, like the aspect, the high, holy Sophia, I'll say, you know, because the agnostic, sometimes it gets confusing for people or or triggering because they feel like maybe she fell or she did something or, you know, that kind of thing. And she got trapped with the archon. So I, when I refer to her as the high, holy Sophia, it's that, that full, whole aspect that is again, equally as powerful as the father aspect and totally complementary, and, and is the expression that we're each being asked those that are ready and, and want the embodiment for that embodiment process to happen. It's that energy that we're bringing in. And then we'll each have our different expressions of that. That's why I loved your message with no one of Sophia And I feel that she's coming in and and however she is, I think there'll be some unifying energy that people can feel of what that is, but then there'll be different expressions, you know, like different, a little bit different Mm -hmm. colors or how that's going to look or different ways, you know, people resonate with different things. And, you know, I I believe that the divine is using everything at this point whatever you have that works for you if you have a good sense of humor that's going to be used if you have whatever it is a gentleness that people need to feel like I said I work in the recovery centers and I think what I'm bringing there as far as that aspect of Sophia is the non-judgment or Mm -hmm. like I'm not seeing these damaged people and I think most people are seeing that as damage. I mean, I'm kind of, I always say, look, you may be sitting there, I may be sitting here, but we're all just walking each other home. Like, which is a famous quote of Ram Das, right? And I love it. They can respond to that because I think that they don't feel judged, you right. know? And yeah. that's the aspect of the mother that I can bring in, as well as I literally go around and do hands-on healing for, e- even if there's 20 mm-hmm. people in the class, everybody might get three minutes but there's something about the the touch that yeah. is very powerful. 
in, in a sacred way. Most people are not touched in sacred ways. I mean, those of us that are more spiritual may go to or do anointings or some kind of blessings, but a lot of people right now in the world are not experiencing that anywhere. Mm, I know. And when you talk about doing like the bridal chamber, I think Dan did explain that a little bit on my podcast. I think he did. But when I first hear that, I was thinking like chastity belt. I was thinking, oh, oh, yeah, nice. you know, what <laughs> is bridal chamber? And is that like what you're talking about? Some sort of blessing that you do? Yeah, it, it was kind of interesting. I, I think at first I didn't really see the full picture. I'm like, well, this is a bridal chamber and I've been asked to do a ritual in it. And this is the ritual I've been given. But is this, you know, how does this line up? And I think it's taken me some time to figure that out. So, so I think of the bridal chamber, right? It's predominantly the relationship between the masculine and the feminine within each of us, right? That has to come together first. Yeah. And I think along with that is the ability to receive your crown, right? Mm -hmm. It's like Mother Mary, you know, when we see the pictures of her famous images um, that when we were, Dan and I were in Europe, we, we went around and looked at the coronation images on the different cathedrals and some are very stylized some are more are more ancient there's one in England um, that is like very primary that the Knights Templar a church there that it appears it's a very I'll say rudimentary image of the coronation and then there's other ones in France like uh, Leon rhymes they all have they have one and, and there's just certain ones that speak to me more than others um, I had a powerful experience with one of those two where the image came down and kind of like, it felt like it stamped itself on me. Um, and it was mm. a beautiful image of Mary, very relational, like looking at Jesus, but like very, you know, in a, in a way that just didn't only look exalted, it looked very grounded and personal, you know? So yeah. I, again, Mary and Jesus, I think are used to represent like the Christ Sophia. That I feel is what's happening in the bridal chamber. The Christ Sophia energies are coming together and that togetherness is the crown. And I'm, I'm reading a book now called Walking the Path of Christ Sophia, exploring the hidden tradition, mm -hmm. Christian spirituality. It was written years ago by a couple and has some very interesting things in there about that I you know recommend. Just this whole idea that you really can't come to the idea of Sophia or certainly Christ Sophia unless you kind of take the routes that are not, let's say, Christian. You know, <laughs> the big I think the big the big paths are like you know yes. Christianity, right? You have to be on the byways and you right. know decide the path you, less you know, chosen. The path next, mm -hmm. Yes, to to receive that, and it's like, but it's necessary. I think once you experience Sophia, you sense in people yourself included is like almost like this responsibility true to share her right and then and i think that we have to have that or we we can't get to compassion there's something about her energy and then again like the christ christ sophia or sophia i know this says christo sophia but i i feel that she's asking also to, to sometimes switch it back and put her name first Sophia. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Sophia Christo. First just, thought. She's the first. Yes, right. It's just a whole other thing. Yeah. And then, you know, I, Dan and I, in our relationship are definitely exploring that. Right. But we each have to have that balance already in ourselves. And then we, we can, we bring that and we can exemplify what that looks like in relationship. Oh, I love that so much. Yeah. You guys yeah. definitely do. And you know, what I find is crazy is that what you said, you said, I didn't, I don't, you didn't want to push people away by like bombarding them with that either. And I feel like that's what I've, it's not even something I've tried to do, but I, first of all, it's not just for women. Right. And I didn't, I wanted, it's kind of like, well, how I explained with my mother, it was almost like a drip. Yes. And that drip turned into, you know, a puddle that turned into a lake that turns into an ocean. And I feel like I've been led to do that with my podcast. It comes in waves as it's divinely led. And right. I hope that, you know, everyone who's ever listened to my podcast knows the name Sophia. 
But, you know, truly, I agree with you that if you just throw throw it all on, it's that's actually not the way of the divine feminine, right? It right. is more subtle and it goes through cycles like the moon, right? It is flowing. Absolutely. And and you, you know, you bring up such a I'm so glad that you you said that, which you said because this is another place, let's say, where where we're swimming in the waters of the way the masculine has done things, right? And it's much more full on, you know, yes. and and that the softer, gentler approach. And I even take that to even the womb chakra teachings, honestly, I, I totally honor and I'm so blessed to have gotten those teachings and, and to be able to teach this work, but um, they're very, it's very strict. Like it's, you know how like meditation, you can't move a muscle type of thing. It's very strict on, you have to do these mantras. You do them for 101 nights. You can't miss a night. If you miss a night, you go back to the first day. Mm. And what I started to see happening is I would have young mothers say to me, you know, I'm pregnant and I really would love to do these mantras. I know they're very powerful, could be very powerful for the baby, but I'm afraid to start because I have two other little boys and I know they're going to interrupt me and I'm never going to get it done. You know, I'm never going to get my mala charged, you know, with this mantra Mm. for 101 nights in a row. It's just never going to happen. And that made me so sad. You know, yeah. and so what I, one of the things that I feel like I'm doing is I'm taking those teachings and I'm trying to put them in a way that is, a, has a more feminine approach. Yeah. Cause a mother and, would know that, that you yes, cannot do that. You cannot do that. And, yes. you know, and I kind of, in that, I go back to the rosary, right? The, you know, uh, the grandmothers would be staring a pot of soup, have a baby on their hip and have Absolutely. a rosary in their, in their apron pocket. Like, and that's okay. That's okay. And holding that other piece, the feminine piece, like I received so much from my Eastern teachings and my meditation, I'm, you know, forever grateful. And, and it's not always practical. And we have to bring back a feminine way of praying, a feminine way of connecting. In an evolved way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and not always necessarily transcending and leaving this realm, which you know, I understand the impetus <laughs> for that, right. but, but no, like bringing it into the body. Like, what does it feel like? How do I be this in this world? And I love that. It's, it's a very different, different way, right? It is. Yeah. I felt that way about Reiki and the way I teach it too. Oh, and wow. like, this is the history and this is, you know, the, I'll teach you, you know, the traditions, but in the end, make it your own. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's, that's really something that has to happen now because it can be accessible once again to women mm-hmm. who are not living in monasteries and, and, yeah. don't, you know, are really doing not the just passed down in secrecy. Yeah. 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 And, you know, there's this whole other, this other thing too, um, that, so um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Sri Aurobindo and the mother, but the mother was like his partner, that his spiritual partner that he worked with. And they have some pretty, you know, had pretty advanced teachings for their time. It's still going on in India where it's, it's actually a lot of French people live there. It's uh, or Auroville, Auroville. It's called A-U-R-O-V-I-L-L-E, Auroville. I wonder if Raja Sriman knows. Have you ever heard of Raja Sriman? She created Kaliki Reiki. You would really vibe with her. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. She actually has a very similar story. You know, she grew up Catholic and she really wanted to teach me of Kali and wanted to know more about Sophia. So we just kind of share and there's so many similarities in our journeys, just like it is with yours. You know, I teach a lot of Reiki, but I've been so, you know, in deep with this divine feminine that it just was natural that that became part of the teaching. And so it was interesting. Of course, her avenue was through Kali and Mm -hmm. mine through the Gnostic Sophia, but I've seen this all over, you know, it's happening and coming through all great goddesses, you know, throughout the world. And Kali is just amazing. And we need Kali. And in fact, um, years ago, before I moved to Mount Chasta, I was staying at a regular bed and old fashioned bed and breakfast before Airbnb. 
And the guy that ran the bed and breakfast was um, a professor at a local college there. And he found my last name is Kelly. He's He claims that that's Kali in Gaelic. Oh, wow. I know. I know. <laughs> See, yeah, so, that's amazing. Yeah. Have you heard the story of my name? No. Tell me. Well, first it started out when I was looking at the name Sophia in mm-hmm. um, Hebrew. There's the Vav. Right. Well, my last name is Zavra, right? So Vav. So it filtered it out. And I was like, what is the Vav? So I went down that road and studied, you know, the Hebrew alphabet. And really, I loved that the her talks were on my podcast and they were like, you need to chant your name, which is very powerful. You know, Vav, Ra, Ra. Wow, yeah, yeah. So then I'm like, I wonder what my first name means. My real first name is Shannon. Well, it means the possessor of hidden wisdom. Wow. Wow. The her talks explained it was all, it's like a connecting piece. I mean, it's so many different things, but it's also the star of David bringing together feminine and masculine. Yes, they yes. call that the Vav. I mean, it's insane. Wow, it's my whole journey. <laughs> that is a whole journey. Yes. Wow. And, 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 you know, and I have been given other spiritual names over the years, but it's interesting because I was recently asked because someone was giving me mention in their new book, if I wanted to, she said, for some reason, she thought I was being, I wanted to be called Diana Sophia. And, um, and so I thought about that. And I kind of got back to her. And I said, No, I think I'm going to stay with my, so I have Diana Marie Kelly, which is there's Anna, Marie is Mary, and Kelly is Kelly. I have I your was, sacred name. Yeah. I've always received names when I've gone through like a major initiation. It usually comes with a name. Right. But you've and, already always stayed true to your name. Um, I have. Well, legally, um, but I yeah. have on different occasions used different ones, uh-huh. maybe in different groups. I, I would kind yeah. of, use this, but I did take on the name Melchizedek legally, actually, as a married name, because I was with a partner, my uh, former husband who took it. And then when we got married, I just took it. Um, oh, wow. It is a powerful one. So, but I'm very happy with my name. And so I said, I got back to her and I said, I, you know, honor your, your message. And I, I believe it was a confirmation for me, but um, I'm going to stay with Diana Marie Kelly. Yeah. So <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Wow. Um, That's so amazing. I love that. Yeah. Sometimes I have people ask me, especially, like I said, at work and I'll say, you know, how did you get on this path? And like, how, how does it affect your life? And I'll say, well, if I had to go back to living without it, it would be like going back to black and white TV, mm. like with the little rabbit ears and whatever, like the antennas, like compared to HD, you know, what we have now, I said, yeah. my, my life is so much richer for this path that I can't imagine going back. I, I, I don't believe that's even an option, but Right. Yeah. Right. You know, and yeah. And who wants to? I I, as challenging and as much as I've been asked to step up and maybe do things that were um, like really on a lot of faith, but I still wouldn't change it. Mm. Well, thank you, Diana, Maria, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes. So tell everybody where they can find you, where if they're interested in learning from you. And also, if you mind sharing your circles. Right. So um, I, my website is lightofthesophia.com. And I have the different things that I offer are there. Our circles are Dan's website, the sophiaproject.net. That is where you could find where we were announcing things. Yeah, like- those, those are so it's very special. I can honestly say you would begin speaking and then... I did not hear words anymore. All Mm -hmm. it was, was energy. Wow. Yeah. It was very powerful. (laughs) That's wonderful. I mean, that's the way it's supposed to work. Right. And your words. And then, and that's when you received your message. Yeah. You know, the words, the words are one thing. And, and, and I become very aware when, when I can feel the energy coming through too. It's a whole, yeah, it's a whole thing. It's a whole, yeah. Like almost. I'm not thrilled about the word channeling, but in a sense, Mm -hmm. there's something happening there. Right. I know. I, you know, I kind of feel the same way. I'm like, (laughs) I never actually felt like I had ever been directly 
speaking to Sophia in some way. You know, I, I felt that I was being led the whole time. Right. But that was such a very strong moment. And I've had so many strong moments, you know, and dreams and all of these things. But it just was, it was big for me. This conversation means so much to me. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. I'm honored to have had the privilege to be here and have this conversation. And it's been wonderful. I agree. It's so natural and such a nice flow. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. I, I feel Sophia, you know, all over this conversation. Mm-hmm. Yes, I honor you so much. Thank you. It's yeah. so wonderful. Tell Dan I said hello. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Sense of Soul podcast. And thanks to our special guests for joining me. If you want more of Sense of Soul, check out my website at www.mysenseofsoul.com where you can work with me one-on-one or help support Sense of Soul podcast by donating to my coffee fund. Thanks for listening.